Well, thank you very much, Rodney, and thanks for setting the bar so low today. <laughs> Nothing like expectations. It's a great pleasure to be here, and, and I feel particularly honored to be included in this fine series uh, that promotes the work of so many distinguished members on this very distinguished faculty. And I also thank all of you for turning out today, and I appreciate that very much. Today I want to discuss, as Rodney indicated, uh, how the rule of law interacts with a world of crisis. And this seems particularly important to me given the fact that we are living in an age in which the war on terror has been described as an indeterminate war. So I want to begin by talking about the rule of law, a concept that was exalted and idealized by Aristotle and championed across a vista of 2,000 years by those interested in pursuing justice, in hindering and restraining the exercise of arbitrary power, and in promoting governmental accountability. All of those are very laudable goals, but we recognize across the centuries that oftentimes the rule of law is stressed when it is challenged by crisis and emergency. You'll recall, for example, that Cicero famously said that in times of war, the laws grow silent. Centuries later, the 17th century champion of parliament and the common law, Sir Edward Cook, echoed those remarks when he said that the, in, in the face of stress and strain, the laws buckle. Well, in American history, we have seen that in periods of crisis and emergency, that in fact our laws buckle and they sag and we wonder, do they grow silent? For example, in 1798, in, during a period known as the undeclared war between the United States and France, Congress passed a series of statutes that encroached upon the exercise of civil liberties by American citizens, including, for example, the infamous Sedition Act, which made it illegal for people to criticize the American government in a way that would cause it to fall into a state of disrepute. As it happened, a number of people who were critical of President John Adams were sent to prison for voicing their criticisms and their displeasure with his policies and programs, including a number of editors of Jeffersonian newspapers and, by the way, a member of Congress from Vermont, Matthew Lyon. And when Lyon was sentenced to prison, uh, he was up for re-election, and his constituents from Vermont re-elected him to another term in the House. That's how you serve two terms at once, by the way. <laughs> that period represented then a serious encroachment on the, on the exercise of freedom of speech and freedom of the press, and it reflected not, not simply the first, but one of many subsequent episodes in which our governmental leaders sometimes lose their minds when they're confronted with emergency or crisis. You can track any number of events across American history and historical periods to come away with that same conclusion. For example, in the Civil War, we witnessed a series of encroachments on the civil liberties of Americans. We've seen, we witnessed a growing, uh, ex very expansive conception of executive power under Abraham Lincoln. And a number of those uh, those actions taken by Lincoln came before the Supreme Court, many of which were not ultimately resolved until after his death. But most people will agree that that marked a period of crisis and emergency in which we saw the rule of law grow silent in America. In World War I, we recognize again that the government was quite capable of engaging in actions that defied the rule of law and stripped Americans of their precious civil rights and civil liberties, including encroachment on freedom of speech and freedom of the press. It was a period in which there were any number of dissenters who dared to disagree with President Wilson's conduct of the war who were sent to prison, including the famous labor organizer Eugene Debs, among many, and this launched a series of famous cases uh, for our law students to study in constitutional law on the scope of freedom of speech and freedom of the press. It was a period marked by governmental intolerance of different viewpoints and different values. 
And if you move forward to World War II, we see a horrific act by our governmental leaders, a passage of a statute by Congress carried into effect through an executive order issued by President Roosevelt to send to prison those members of our society who happen to be Japanese American citizens in what was largely regarded as the most horrific act against a group of people at any particular time in American history. Certainly there was severe deprivation of due process of law as well as the equal protection of the laws in a period in which America had grown not merely restive about the presence within our country of Japanese American citizens but outright panicked by the fear generated by intelligence officers that the presence of Japanese American citizens represented a profound threat to our national security. In the period known as McCarthyism, the period of the Cold War, which emerged from the end of the Second World War, we saw again further, further violations of important civil liberties, due process of law, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and a period marked by governmental intolerance of those who dared to hold different views, different sentiments, and different values about the nature of our constitutional system and the role that citizens should play in participating in American politics. This period of McCarthyism represented a period of terrible repression. One more instance of how the government can lose its mind during the course of a perceived crisis. And then, of course, leaping forward into our most immediate recent past, and that is the aftermath of the attack on America in 9-11. We have witnessed an ongoing expansion of executive power to the point where the president, beginning with George Bush, claimed virtually unlimited authority to conduct the war on terror, as he described it, a period in which the president violated numerous provisions of the Constitution, including the claim of a unilateral executive power to engage in not merely preemptive war, but preventive war, the authority to authorize acts of extraordinary rendition, to create military tribunals without authorization from Congress, to detain people indefinitely, to deny them access to attorneys, to deny them access to courts. And at an early point, in 2002, the Attorney General referred to the Bill of Rights as quaint. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think villages are quaint. Cottages are quaint. But for the Attorney General of the United States, the chief law enforcement official in the country, to dismiss the importance of the Bill of Rights and to label it as quaint during a period known as the War on Terror shows us once more that the rule of law is often susceptible to claims of reason of state, as Sir Edward Cook said, or the blanket invocations of necessity and national security. And so at some point we wonder, at what point does the concept of the rule of law, which is enshrined in the Constitution and represents the hallmark of our constitutional democracy, at what point does that concept of the rule of law fall beneath the weight of assertions by executives and other governmental leaders to suppress that pillar of our constitutional system known as the rule of law. What happens to our constitutional system when in fact the principle of the rule of law ceases to be the norm, ceases to be the operational guide for our system? What happens when crises and claims of emergencies become the norm? and the rule of law becomes the exception, turning our world up down, upside down in a kind of Humpty Dumpty version. Instead of the rule of law and the Constitution governing, we find the rule of law and the Constitution being governed by executive claims of necessity and national security and reason of state. What does our world look like? What what does our constitutional system look like when the rule of law ceases to be the operative principle? To address that, let's consider some of the fundamental principles adopted by the framers of our Constitution and enshrined in important Supreme Court precedents across the decades. 
to begin at the beginning in the Constitutional Convention in 1787, the framers believed that they had achieved an attainable ideal. And that was to give great weight to the rule of law by placing it within our constitutional system and structuring the Constitution so that on a daily basis, those principles of law would be adhered to by our government, honored by various governmental officials, because there was the understanding that government had no authority to violate the Constitution. George Washington, a precedent setter in many ways, for example, said to his friends that his greatest fear as president was to be labeled a usurper. That was a four-letter word. He never wanted it to be said of him that he had violated the law or violated the Constitution because he thought if a president were to do that or any governmental actor were to do that, for example, that would not only set a terrible precedent, but it would suggest that the government holds the people in contempt that it would represent an outright denial of the right of the people to draft a constitution that reflects their values, their choices, their sentiments, and their views, that in fact the sovereignty of the people would be dismissed by those who arrogate power to themselves as they assume high office. And so Washington said to his friends in many, many letters that he most greatly feared being regarded as a usurper. The government at all times was understood to be bound by the Constitution with no authority, as Alexander Hamilton said, to new model its commission, to remake its commission, because that too would represent a denial of the right of the people to fashion a government of their choosing, a right that is traced right back to the Declaration of Independence, and it justified our very revolutionary acts against England, as Thomas Jefferson eloquently provided it is a natural right for the people to establish a government of their choosing, and when that right is violated, then they have the right to revolt. And so these clear sentiments expressed in Philadelphia in 1787 and reiterated by George Washington took root in our constitutional system. It provided the cornerstone that, in fact, the only power government enjoys is that power that is granted by the Constitution, power either spelled out, enumerated in the Constitution, or fairly implied. But the government has no authority to go beyond the four corners of the Constitution because that would mark a claim by a governmental actor to improvise laws, to improvise values, to impose views and values and sentiments on the people that the people did not possess by themselves. And that is what George Washington steadfastly opposed. That very concept that government is limited by that grant of authority found within the four corners of the Constitution, either enumerated or implied, represents the cornerstone of the rule of law. And when executives attempt to add to the Constitution powers not granted to them by the Constitution, then that marks what Washington regarded as an utter contempt of the people. That is what we see in a period of crisis, when executives forget that the authority granted to that office, the office of the presidency, by the Constitution was in fact sharply delimited. But what we see in the claim of a presidential authority to act in the name of national security or to act in the name of necessity, is an arrogation of power that finds no root in the Constitution. And that's what we have seen repeatedly throughout American history, and it becomes a matter of great concern, as I mentioned in this period known as the War on Terror, which has been determined to be a war of indeterminable length. When an executive acts in the name of emergency, to confront a crisis, that president is essentially claiming the authority to make laws. Essentially the claim to rewrite the laws, to rewrite the Constitution, to meet whatever emergency or crisis that president perceives. That raises the issue, has the president a revisory power? When presidents have claimed the authority, for example, to suspend habeas corpus, as President Bush did through his attorney general, 
when presidents claim the authority to make war on their own claim of power, as numerous presidents have since 1950, when the president claims to have authority to engage in acts of extraordinary rendition or to detain people for an indeterminate amount of time, to deny them access to an attorney, to deny them access to the courts of law, and to say that courts have no authority to review presidential action, those are all exercises in what we would call the claim of a revisory power. What happens to our constitutional system if presidents may revise the Constitution at their whim, at their pleasure? At that point, the constitutional system clearly begins to buckle. We have seen, as I pointed out, a number of examples across American history, but we have not yet seen a period in which these ongoing claims, first initiated by President Bush, now embraced and continued, unfortunately, by President Obama, we now see a period in which presidents are claiming authority that are, to say the least, capacious claims of executive power, and to put it in the worst case scenario, a claim by the president to overleap the limit of constitutional boundaries. What does our system look like when that happens? The first thing we would say is that every action by a president that violates the Constitution, breaks down those constitutional fences that surround the president and limit authority. We also see in that claim a fact that every violation encourages additional violations of the Constitution, additional violations of the rule of law, an ongoing sense that the rule of law does not act on a daily basis to confine presidential actions but rather those constitutional barriers are nothing more than hurdles to be surmounted by presidents. What also happens is that the American people become accustomed to emergency actions by the president and begin to embrace within their own sense of constitutional culture that in times of crisis, in times of national security needs as declared by the president, that it's permissible for the government to violate constitutional limits, that it's permissible for the government to deny the rights and liberties enjoyed by the American people. That kind of encroachment on the rights and liberties of the American people and that kind of disregard by presidents of constitutional limitations breeds a constitutional culture in which the rule of law ceases to be the operative norm and becomes the exception. In a period of crisis, the rule of law no longer obtains. And it's not as though we should believe that these kinds of claims will cease at any point in the near future. Because, in fact, the expansion of executive power, clearly witnessed at least since 1950 when President Harry Truman claimed the unilateral authority to take the nation into war in Korea, quite apart from the fact that the Constitution grants the war power solely and exclusively to Congress, ushered in a period of time in which presidents now, both Republicans and Democrats alike, liberals and conservatives alike, would claim the war power. And this thought has generated so much steam, so much acceptance among the American people that we are surprised now when scholars and others concerned about the Constitution say to presidents, wait a minute, you don't have the authority to take the nation into war without congressional authorization. But what happens when we see a long stretch in American history, now more than a half century old, in which presidents claim the unilateral authority to take the nation into war from Korea and Vietnam forward, Americans grow accustomed to those claims. What happens to the rule of law? It buckles. Those organizations and individuals charged with duties to enforce the Constitution, to speak out against its violations, begin to buckle and cooperate as well. And so the great newspapers of our time reach the point where they too accept that the president as the commander in chief must have the authority to take the nation into war despite the fact that the Constitution 
clearly grants that power to Congress. Now, when presidents routinely come to dominate the realm of foreign affairs, even though the lion's share of foreign affairs powers are granted to Congress, not the president, newspapers and talking heads and classroom instructors begin to teach that the president is the sole organ of American foreign policy entrusted by the Constitution to formulate and to manage American foreign policy in spite of the facts. As scholars here in this room, we like to think that the facts and evidence count. They ought to. But all too often, they don't get in the way. That in fact, people begin to, as Obama says, make up stuff. And that stuff becomes the discourse of our day, quite apart from what the Constitution requires. And so, in this third point then, we see that when we talk about the consequences of the of the unraveling of the rule of law, we believe then that this, const thank you, we believe that this constitutional culture then ceases to be one in which people take seriously that the Constitution is an everyday operational governing document. We cease to take seriously the fact that the Constitution was intended to be all Broadway all the time, and instead we see the Constitution pushed to the wings of the national stage. When we see this, you might ask, what can we claim about our national constitutional system? We can look back at history and we can understand what happens when the rule of law loses its respect. We can understand what happens when the great values enshrined within the rule of law cease to carry any weight. And we can understand what happens when the concept of law becomes the handmaiden of tyranny, because we've seen it across the globe countless times. In the 20th century, we saw the rise of Hitler, and many of his actions were applauded. We saw the popularity of Joseph McCarthy for a long time in the early 1950s, who gained great power and received applause. We have seen time and again how executives taking strong actions which received the approval of the American people in spite of the fact that they're against the Constitution, receive applause from their supporters. That shows the kind of contempt for constitutional government. It shows the subversion of the rule of law, and it puts the executive on the horse of power, trampling the liberty of the people and the rule of law underneath. And then that raises in our minds, how do we recover that rule of law, once it's been trampled, trampled not only by ambitious executives who show no regard for constitutional restraints and laws, and receiving the approval of the people who now judge legality, not by constitutional terms, but by result. What do we say about the status of our constitutional system? Here is what we say. We say that the appreciation for the virtues and values of constitutionalism have disappeared, taking a back seat to Machiavellianism, which exalts the success over the means employed. In a Machiavellian system, of course, it's all about achieving the ends, regardless of the means. In a constitutional system, we're reminded, it is all about the means to an end, because a constitutional system is one that grants power to governmental actors to pursue results based on agreed upon rules and programs and procedures. But in a period in which the rule of law is no longer the dominant theme, in a period in which Machiavellianism, described as the ends justify the means, is in ascent, then we lose all those protections afforded by a constitutional system. We can no longer be confident that our rights of free speech and freedom of expression will be protected. We can no longer be confident that due process will be operative. We can no longer be confident that we will be given access to Sixth Amendment rights, including a right to an attorney. And we can no longer be confident when executives claim that courts cannot review their actions. We can no longer be confident that our cases will even be heard by a judiciary. And we ask, in this descent, in this fall from constitutionalism, 
into Machiavellianism, we can ask, where are those other institutions? It's one thing for ambitious executives to claim broader and broader authority because history tells us that that's what executives do. But what about Congress? And what about the courts? What we see in this era of decline is Congress rushing for safety to the sidelines of the field, not wanting to carry the battle, not wanting to defend its powers, its constitutional prerogatives, to challenge executive usurpation and aggrandizement of power for many reasons, but including the greatest desire to achieve re-election after re-election after re-election. Members of Congress evade their constitutional responsibilities, refuse to defend their constitutional turf, and acquiesce in the face of executive usurpation of power. In short, Congress loses its interest in defending its own institutional powers, and Congress gives way to ambitious executives. The courts themselves find all kinds of doctrines, some of them technical, some of them substantive, to evade their responsibility to corral executive power and to bring a halt to these actions that are clearly unconstitutional. Courts find all manner of reasons to evade their own responsibilities and the net sum of their total, the net sum of their decisions then is judicial acquiescence to executive assertions of power. When that happens, and I submit that is happening in America today and has been happening for a good many years, when that happens, we see the concentration of governmental power in one department, unchallenged by the two institutions which could stop that process, unchallenged by the American people who become more concerned, rightly so in many respects, more concerned about getting a job, putting food on the table, less concerned about adherence to constitutional government because after all, a hungry stomach speaks more loudly than concerns about constitutional matters. When that happens and the executive is in assent, then we wonder what has happened to our constitutional system. What has happened to those virtues and values enshrined in the Constitution? What has happened to the great hope of the framers who believed that the rule of law was attainable? And by the way, at their point in time, the rule of law held a precise meaning. It was the subordination of the executive to the rule of law. And at that point in time, that represented the precise distinction between a monarchy and an executive republic, and a republican executive. We're far past that point. We live in an era known by different terms, presidential government, the imperial presidency, the personal presidency, the, the um, plebiscitary presidency, we live in a period in which it's quite clear that the president has acquired power exercised by Congress and the courts cease to intervene to stop this presidential aggrandizement of power. We wonder what can we do as citizens? What can we do as citizens when we see the doctrine of checks and balances no longer carrying out its outlined purposes? What can we do when we see the separation of powers falling by the wayside and the roadways across America littered with constitutional principles? What we can remember, as sculpted by a famous historian, Howard McElwain, who wrote a half a century ago, is this. The great duty on the part of the citizenry is to continue to fight for the rule of law and its legal limits on the exercise of arbitrary power and a complete accountability by the government to the governed. There is nobody else to do that in our system save for the American people. And the question always is, how willing are you, how willing are we, to abandon those constitutional principles which for much of our history have protected us from arbitrary governmental action. Thank you.
In the spirit of democracy, this is equal time, right? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for those, those good comments. Let's take the second one first. Uh, Justice Jackson once noted that, in fact, the Constitution is not a suicide pact. Well, the question is, what are the implications of that line? Taken in a cavalier way, that is pregnant with menace, because that would suggest that the government as a whole, and particularly the executive, can assume powers not granted by the Constitution. The issue arises, what happens when we confront a crisis or an emergency that is not covered by law because we understand of course that it is not possible for any legislative body to anticipate every crisis or emergency that the nation might confront. The framers of the Constitution had an interesting choice to make. They might have followed the practice of the English and other countries of assuming that the executive would have an emergency power. That's one option certainly the option described by John Locke in his famous writings. But they chose another course. They chose another course because that same Justice Jackson in the famous 1952 steel seizure case said, the framers did not vest in the president an emergency power because, he wrote, they suspected that the creation of an emergency power would tend to kindle emergencies. And I think that, the, that he was exactly right. The framers understood, because they were keen students of history, how the enjoyment of a power to proclaim an emergency and then take all the steps necessary to meet and satisfy that emergency would in fact kindle emergency. So the natural question is, if the framers did not confer upon the executive an emergency power, and yet because they were acutely aware of the fact that many emergencies would outrun legislation on the books, what did they do? to handle emergencies. Here's what they did. They followed an old practice of, of what we would call retroactive legislation. And that precisely is the ability of a, of a governmental actor, president or otherwise, to perceive an emergency, to act illegally or unconstitutionally to meet the emergency, but then come to the lawmaking branch of government, in this case Congress, explain his or her actions explain why she undertook to violate the law to meet the emergency. And if those reasons are substantial enough and persuasive enough, then the legislative body, the lawmaking body, will confer retroactive authorization, making those illegal actions legal after the fact. And the importance of that is that it maintains a semblance of constitutional government. Because if the president were able to perceive an emergency, claim the authority to take any actions necessary to meet that emergency, and then justify it all by what is known as the doctrine of necessity, there would be no limits on executive power. And so the framers decided that it would be far better to resort to this doctrine of retroactive legislation. And we have seen this uh, in, on a number of occasions in our history. So, for example, during the Revolutionary War, the governor of Virginia, Nelson, illegally spent money from the state treasury, illegally appropriated war material and supply. That was a legislative power. He believed it necessary to do, otherwise there would be significant losses uh, in Virginia. Afterward, he went to the Virginia legislature, explained his reasons, the Virginia legislature decided that if it had been in session at that point, that it could have written a law on the spot, so to speak, to authorize those emergency actions taken by the governor. The significance of the action to engage in retroactive legislation then is to be found in the fact that the judgment of the legislature is the ultimate judgment. That an executive who would claim an emergency power cannot be permitted to say, I've seen an emergency, here's what I'm doing to solve it, and I don't want any questions, thank you. In 1792, the Congress was reviewing some allegations that then Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton 
had violated some appropriation statutes. Ultimately, Congress found that he had not violated his authority, but participants in the debate in the House on both sides, those supporting Hamilton, those opposing Hamilton, agreed that whatever might happen, it would be necessary to resort to congressional judgment, and if it was learned that he, in fact, he had violated his authority, then he could be saved by retroactive legislation. Thomas Jefferson, as president, encountered uh, the uh, problem in 1807 when, during the Chesapeake crisis, he found it necessary to spend money from the U.S. Treasury and to appropriate supplies. Both powers were, of course, legislative powers. He knew he acted unconstitutionally. He referred it to Congress, and then Congress approved of his actions retroactively because it was persuaded that he had acted wisely, reasonably, and necessarily, and therefore it approved of his actions. The most famous example, however, of retroactive ratification occurred during the presidency of Abraham Lincoln, where Lincoln, as you may know, violated the Constitution in significant ways. He too spent money from the Treasury. He also called up the troops, which is a congressional power, and of course he suspended habeas corpus, among other actions. But on July 4, 1861, when he called, when Congress returned from its recess, he explained that his actions were probably illegal, but he trusted that Congress would ratify his actions. So there's Lincoln, mindful of the need to, to lead the country to victory, carrying out actions which he thought were indispensable to saving the Union, but always with an eye on the Constitution turning toward Congress to say, I hope you will ratify these actions. Congress did that, making Lincoln's illegal or unconstitutional actions legal after the fact. In many ways, Lincoln is, is my favorite president because of his commitment to the Constitution, although I should say, in the era of ongoing expansion of executive power, my new favorite president is William Henry Harrison, one of those presidents that nobody's ever heard about because he was in the mid-19th century, right? And he only served for 30 days because he died of pneumonia, but he didn't abuse power. That's why he's my favorite. I'm, I'm calling for a national holiday in the name of William Henry Harrison. But apart from Harrison, Lincoln is my favorite president because he knew that he had taken actions that were unconstitutional, but which he thought were indispensable to saving the Union. And then he returned to Congress to ask Congress for ratification. We would be far better if we had more presidents who are like Lincoln, that's easy to say, but more presidents who are Lincoln and seek ratification of their actions. We don't have that any longer because, of course, across the decades, presidents have claimed broader and broader authority, and if you now believe you have authority to do whatever you want to do, there would never be a need to come to Congress to seek retroactive ratification because, by definition, anything you do is legal. Uh, please, in the back. So, with that, uh, with that commentary in mind, how would you characterize the War Powers Act? Is that just a codification or institutionalizing this idea of retroactive, retroactive mm. uh, legislation? I appreciate that question. The War Powers Act of 1973 reflected the good intentions of members of Congress to try to rein in unilateral executive war making which had become all the rage from Korea through Vietnam, but it reflected, unfortunately, some pretty pervasive ignorance by members of Congress as to their own constitutional powers. Under the War Clause, which is found in Article 1, Section 8, the power to take the nation into war, either through a formal declaration or through the authorization of lesser military hostilities falling short of complete or perfect war, all those powers are granted to Congress. But unfortunately, what happened in the War Powers Act of 1973 is that Congress delegated the war power to the president, unwittingly, by allowing the president, in effect, to deploy troops into battle and for a period of 60 days, and it could be extended to 90 days if he receives authorization from Congress, but it provided that, quote, in all possible circumstances, the president shall consult with Congress before deploying troops in all possible circumstances. Well, that exception is so large you can drive the proverbial Mack truck right through it because no president yet since the passage of that act 
has found time to consult with Congress. And there have been some pretty flagrant violations of that statute, but one that I think is particularly illustrative involves President Reagan, who on October 25th, 1983, invaded Grenada. And afterward, he was asked at a press conference, why didn't you consult with Congress under the War Powers Act? And he said, well, I didn't have time. Well, we later learned that two weeks before the invasion, he had been on the telephone with the Prime Minister of England, Margaret Thatcher, saying, in two weeks, we're going to invade Grenada. Well, I think if you have time to inform a foreign head of state that you're about to initiate hostilities, you probably have time to go down the street to Congress and consult. But that reflects the arrogance of the executive, that the war power belongs to the president. And so, to bring this to a short conclusion, the War Powers Act, I believe, is unconstitutional because it unconstitutionally delegates the war power to the president, and Congress may not delegate away, no matter how generous its spirit is, it may not delegate its constitutional powers to the president because that violates the separation of powers. And the court has routinely held that it's impermissible for the Congress to delegate its constitutional powers. It would be as, as gross as if Congress were to delegate the lawmaking power or the appropriations power. And unfortunately, what we've seen is that Congress giving away its war power adds further to the growing authority of the executive over foreign affairs and war making. Yeah, right, right here, please. Mm -hmm. those yes and no. Yeah, good question. The answer is yes and no. When presidents want to defend their doubtful actions in foreign affairs, and there are a good many of those, they often turn to a Supreme Court decision in 1936 called United States versus Curtis Wright. Rodney mentioned my book. You should buy lots of copies, by the way. <laughs> and, and in that decision, the court unfortunately engaged in, in some dicta and held that the president is the sole organ of American foreign policy and therefore, when presidents want to justify their actions, they always invoke Curtis Wright. It's become so common that one scholar pointed out that the citation to Curtis Wright follows like this. Curtis Wright, therefore I'm right, cite. The problem is, and this is the second part of your question, the problem is, is that the Supreme Court in the steel seizure case in 1952 dismissed that line as dicta. So the court itself has dismissed much of what was said in Curtis Wright, but it does not matter to presidents, and this is really the theme of your question, it doesn't matter to presidents because they are bent on achieving their foreign policy goals and they'll simply cite whatever they can find to justify their actions. And that's troublesome because the Curtis Wright opinion is so, so gross in its violation of every tenet of the Constitution that it's troublesome because presidents will rely on that decision even though it finds no foundation in our constitutional architecture, not the text of the Constitution, not the Constitutional Convention, or any preceding uh, judicial rulings. It's an exercise, and I think, in the ongoing Machiavellian tendencies of presidents to be ends-oriented, disregarding the means to that end. Uh, yeah, Michael, please. Um, I'm curious about the, the last point you, you made. That, um, it seems like maybe one could come in and say that these examples that you've pointed to, the, the judicial opinions and, and executive decisions and legislative responses and so forth, uh, reflect kind of the, the, the engine of change that you, you, you need to have operating in a, a, a vibrant country like this one mm -hmm. in order to deal with the fact that we're not living in the 18th century anymore, right? I mean, that, that things, that it, the world changes in many ways that were completely un, unforeseen by the framers, and that the, and the, 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 the Constitution, or at least our constitutional form of government, has to be flexible enough in the face of, of changing circumstances mm -hmm. 
to provide, I mean, in a way, this is just a footnote to Steve's question, right? To provide um, for the needs of the, of the, the, the people at that time. And that, that maybe some of the sure. responses really are just a, um, a reflection of, of the, the organic nature of a constitutional form of government. Right? Yeah. Something like that. Could, right. Could, yeah, sure. No, thank you for that. For that, those those are excellent points. Certainly, points that have to be dealt with. <clears throat> the reality is, is that our constitutional system provides for change, and that's found in Article Five, the amendatory clause. So, if 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 we decided, as a nation, that we don't want any longer for the bulk of foreign affairs powers to be granted to Congress, or the war power to be granted to the president uh, to the Congress, but would rather have it in the hands of the president, then we need to resort to the amendatory process, which would follow a broad national discussion weighing the pros and cons of making that shift. But what often happens, and you use the right phrase, what often happens is that since 1787, we've seen a broad change in the nature of the country, the international realm, and so change of circumstance is often invoked as a justification for presidential assumption of these authorities. The problem with that, of course, is that amounts to the claim that the president enjoys a revisory power. May the president revise the Constitution because the president wants this power. And, and if we go down that line, then we have to agree that the president is simply claiming the authority to be unchained by the Constitution, to be unhindered by either statutory restraints or constitutional provisions. But that's exactly what has occurred over the past 60 or 60 years or so in which presidents have claimed broader and broader authority they invoke national security they invoke emergency they invoke crisis they invoke changing circumstances and while we all know that the world has grown smaller by virtue of technological advances those changes of course don't alter the constitution the distribution of power is well within the subject of the American people to engage in a vigorous discussion and debate. But if we succumb to the argument made by presidents on, in both parties that it's necessary for the president to exercise this power, then we have just exalted executive power above and beyond the Constitution. Please. It seems to me that losing the culture based on the rule of law is more of a personal problem than it is a problem with the laws themselves. So in your opinion, what would be necessary to begin to rehabilitate that culture and recapture the rule of law in the American mind? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. In, in a chapter that I have in this book, it calls for, that was shameless, wasn't it? <laughs> shameless plug. Uh, I call for uh, the three C's. I say that we need to individually develop a constitutional conscience. That is to say that we take seriously the need in our country for our government to obey the Constitution. Each individual can develop a constitutional conscience. What that leads to is the development of a constitutional consciousness on the part of society to cry down governmental actions that violate the rights and liberties of America or exceed the constitutional authority of, of governmental actors, which will lead to the creation of a constitutional culture. So the three C's, constitutional conscience, consciousness and constitutional culture. Now that's easier said than done because for so many years uh, many of us have been tempted to overlook constitutional violations because perhaps we appreciate or support the policy that violated the Constitution and that makes us swallow hard choosing between on the one hand let us say our ideological or or political predilections versus constitutional concerns. But I think it's incumbent upon American citizens to exalt the Constitution first and foremost so that party politics, partisan concerns play a subordinate role. Easier said than done. And so your question is how to do it. I think that it should be done through the educational process. No surprise there as an educator. But it's important for students in the high schools and at the universities to understand the importance of constitutional government. And I think one way to show that is to examine those countries which have ceased to follow the rule of law, ceased to um, practice uh, constitutional government, and we could cite all kinds of historical episodes. I think that's the road toward Auschwitz or Belsen. 
I think the problem is, is that if Americans cease to try to restrain their government because they want to practice what we would call, um, what we might want to call uh, constitutional exceptionalism, making exceptions for those governmental actions with which we agree, even though they violate the Constitution, then in fact we give, then we give flight to all those others who would like to support governmental actions in spite of the fact that they violate the Constitution. I think selective constitutionalism is not healthy for a constitutional system. It seems to be as a matter of definition a violation of constitutional government to begin with. And what that really means is we operate within our constitutional system and if we don't like the way the Constitution allocates powers or rights or liberties that are protected by the Constitution, then we work to change them. The argument against this, and this is similar to the point that um, Michael was raising earlier, the, the counterpoint to that is oftentimes the people don't, need, don't know what they need. And so this is, an, this is a call for elitism, to have people simply assume the decision-making process to do what's right for the country. Not necessarily what's constitutional, but to do what's right. And there's a long streak of elitism running through him, human discourse all the way back to Plato at least. The question for us, if we want to go down that road and to embrace some sort of selective constitutionalism, is to ask, what's the record of elites making those decisions? What is, in fact, the record of elites, presidents included, making decisions irrespective of constitutional restraints? I think if you look at one area, and that is the war power, we've not done so well. President Truman took us into war in Korea, disaster. We had a succession of presidents that took us into Vietnam without congressional authorization. The war in Iraq was made unilaterally. The decision to invade Iraq was made unilaterally by President Bush. And the, the consequences of that war have not been healthy for the country from a foreign policy standpoint, from a national security standpoint, and certainly from a financial standpoint. So whenever you hear people say, well, the people don't know what's best for them, and they're urging elitism, then I think you should stand ready to question that premise pretty quickly. In the back, please. Um, do you see a historical correlation between um, democratic republics and the transition into dictatorships? Maybe something like we saw with the Soviets, mm. how they initially had set up a democratic republic to transition, but the rule of law was eroded. I mean, can you, can you think of some circumstances historically where you think that's really Well, you can certainly point, you, that's a good question. You can certainly point to what occurred in Germany, right? As democratic as Germany was before the rise of Hitler, you saw what the concentration of unlimited power in that executive uh, had for the world, right? Uh, and, and you can look back even further in history or even to scholarly works. Uh, you can look back, for example, at the famous debates between the Athenians and the Malians as portrayed in Thucydides' wonderful work, of Pel the, uh, the History of the Peloponnesian War, where that famous dialogue occurs whether or not you can but whether you can save democracy by violating democracy, whether you can preserve rights by violating rights, whether you can preserve liberty by violating liberty. And of course the discussion I think yields a pretty conclusion, pretty clear conclusion that you can't. Once those liberties have been abandoned in the name of security, then they're lost. And that brings me to, I know we're about out of time, so let me wrap it up here, unless Rodney grants more time. Let me wrap it up this way. When we heard in the early days of the Bush administration's conduct of the war on terror by two successive attorneys general that the American people need to be willing to sacrifice some of their liberties in order to maintain national security, question number one arises, who grants governmental actors the authority to deny the rights and liberties of the American people? And question number two, well, which rights and liberties. Are we prepared to surrender to achieve that ghost of national security? And oh, by the way, how can we know if we do indeed abandon or surrender rights and liberties that we're going to achieve the national security that the president says is out there for us to grab? Those are important questions.